but you know, just thinking about how we can get better all the time is really that area where I think that that's where the that's where HR can become, you know, not so worried about cost, but can be really a help us grow and help us be better. Welcome to the HR Like a Boss video series. If it resonates with you, please consider liking, commenting, and subscribing or sharing with a friend. In the description below, you will find social media links on how to see and listen to the complete podcast interview. I've embarked on a journey to get to know amazingly awesome HR and business professionals, and these conversations create the foundation for my book on what it takes to do HR like a boss. And on today's episode, I'm super excited to be joined by Chris Dyer. Chris is a keynote speaker, best-selling author. He's also a remote work leader and consultant. He's the CEO of People G2, which is an amazing employment background check company. And he's also the radio host of a podcast radio show called Talent Talk, which I recently was a guest on and how we got connected today. So Chris, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. So it's pretty cool. We have a lot of things in common uh, other than where we live, you being in California, me being here in uh, Northeast Ohio, but it's so awesome through these virtual platforms that we're able to get together. And I know you have, you've written a book and are writing a book. So there's some commonality there. And we both have virtual companies. We started about eight to 10 years ago, which is really pretty cool. And we have these little podcast things going. I guess mine's little, yours is a little bit um, uh, more, more popular and been around longer. So uh, tell, tell those that don't know who you are that are listening in or watching a little bit about yourself. Yeah, I mean, I think you, you did a good job of, of giving all the, uh, you know, the, the play-by-play there of my resume. You know, I think I'm just uh, like yourself. I'm someone who is fascinated by uh, how we manage talent, about how, what do really talented people do? I mean, I think I, I've spent a lifetime at conferences and networking events and, you know, picking the brains of people who I admire or I think are doing something really special, really smart, um, and also learning how to like turn out the noise, right? To learn how to not pay attention to people who don't know what they're talking about or don't, uh, you know, or just have an opinion to have an opinion, don't really have one that is, you know, we should be listening to. So it's sort of been a journey for me to really learn all that stuff. And then somewhere along the way, I accumulated enough knowledge that then I just started repeating it back to people and, um, that turned out to, to, to work well. So I can help out companies and write books and, you know, talk, talk on podcasts and do things like that. But most importantly, try to create uh, every day the best place for my people to work uh, and to make sure my employees are motivated and that they're empowered. And honestly, they can do their jobs without having to, you know, knock on my uh, virtual office every day. Yeah. Congrats. Yeah. That's no small feat. And Certainly something when you start, I know I had so many people ask me, how in the world are you doing that? How are you, how are you having a business that's virtual? And then as it grow, grew and people got to know more about it, I think they became more fascinated. And I think to that point, the kind of interaction that most people are used to having around a brick and mortar, it seems so much easier. But in my opinion, it's way more efficient and effective to do it in a way that's virtual because you're, you're using your time wisely and then you're getting people that align to what what works within your culture and your business. So congrats. Thank you. So cool. So, all right. So you talked about your book. So a uh, two, twofold question as we get things kicked off. I know you wrote a book called The Power of Company Culture. So love to hear a little bit about that and that journey for you. And then I know you also said you're writing another book. So curious about yeah. that one as well. Yeah. So the, the first book, The Power of Company Culture is really uh, that culmination of knowledge and things that I learned. Not what I figured out through all my research uh, and it really began with uh, me wanting to change my company, realizing back in 2008, 2009, we were going to do things differently. And one of those things was to go remote. But I said, if, let's just let's try to make this the best possible place we can to work. And so the, the question be, really came up is, well, what's the best place to work? What does that mean? Right. What are these things that we need to be thinking about and doing and what are the best companies doing consistently? And it became very obvious after reading hundreds of books and talking to thousands of leaders and you know, and all the things that I had ingested over time, um, that there are some very specific truths. There are things, and I call them my, my pillars, are the seven pillars of great company culture. And in any company, 
If they think about these seven things and they work on these seven things all the time, they will have a great culture, right? As long as they're, I guess, doing a good job with them, right? I mean, they can't just think about it, but they're doing great things inside these seven areas. And what's really cool about that is it's not a standard blueprint. It's not, you have to do things just like Google or just like Facebook or just like Amazon or, or pick anyone in your industry. You can interpret these things your own way, but it's that you're doing something intentional about these seven pillars that really, really makes uh, the biggest impact on companies. So in the first third of the book, I talk about what you got to do, like what's the minimum, right? What do you got to do to at least like not suck uh, and be okay at company culture? Like, you know, what are the things people expect? What do you got to do? The middle of the book is what are these seven pillars, what are these great things that companies are doing? And now that you know that, the last third of the book is like, how do you actually do it? How do you actually get things done? How do you create change in your organization? And then I really peppered in a lot of the most, the best stories that I was getting on my podcast, you know, from everything from people from General Motors and Southwest Airlines and, or even just the small, you know, company down the street from me that that's doing an awesome job. So kind of mixed in a lot of stories, you know, people like stories. Um, and so that's the, the, fir the, the first book. And I am, like you said, just wrapping up a book on called Remote Work, pretty simple. And it's going to be how to have a remote company, whether you want to go remote or you are remote, like what are all the things you got to do to be remote? And I'm writing that with my, my mentor and co-author, uh, Kim Shepard, and she had a remote organization as well and sold that for a uh, top dollar recruiting company. And so her and I are sort of giving everyone all of our best stuff on everything that we do and we think are as important for remote. Maybe unfair for me to ask, because I know if you have a house that's got seven pillars and you take one of them down, uh, the house will come crumbling. So I'm sure intentional within your book, but is, is there one particular piece of advice that you could give to an executive as to how to ensure they leverage their company's culture? Well, if I had to pick one pillar for people to start with, I mean, usually what I tell them is evaluate the pillars and then decide which one is the, where you're the weakest. Right. And you should you should work at the one that is the worst. Often people will say, well, I'm good at these five, but I have two pillars that I'm struggling with. And let's start with the easy one. And I disagree with that philosophy. I think you should go with the one that you're the worst at and get better at that because that will have the biggest gain for your organization. And it sort of gets sort of gets uh, it's like a it's like a good habit. Right. When when you have a big win and people see, geez, we made a change. We really focused on this. And wow, did this make a difference? Then people start looking for that kind of change everywhere. But to, to answer your question more specifically and not be a politician, since we're already dealing with too much of that these days, um, if I had to pick a pillar, not knowing anything about the organization, I would say a CEO should spend as much of their time as possible on transparency, which is my first pillar. How can you be more transparent with your people, with your organization, do you share financials? Do you share goals? Do you share, I mean, I, I'm on with my company every month telling, showing everyone our financials. We're talking about profit and loss. We're talking about why sales are up or why they're down and where we're spending money. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. That's some good insight. So switching gears or maybe not necessarily because culture is such a big part of, of HR. Uh, one of the main things I like to do in these conversations and, and trying to get at like, why are we doing this in human resources? What, what, is, the, what is the purpose of, of HR? So how, how would you describe that from a theory perspective and maybe some of the things that you're doing within your organization or other companies you're helping? Well, I guess if you put it on the HR lens, there's, there's always going to be two parts in my mind. And that first part is, it is a definitely a risk aversion. It's definitely a, right, there's, the, there's all these things that in all these, different states that we have to do or not do for our employees, right? We have to make sure they get paid. We have to follow the law. We've got to, and that's a complicated job. And so half of, or at least one part, I shouldn't say half, but one part of HR's job will always be, unless we rename it and call it something else one day, will be that part, right? It's the, it's the, the risk uh, avoidance. It's the, you know, the, the tactical stuff. But really, they the other part that HR really should be thinking about is how do we not only help our people, help our help the companies, you know, stay out of trouble, but how do we help our people grow and how do we help them be happy? So, and and inside of that is, 
in my mind, is if you put the, the lens of culture, is culture is the norms and it is the it's the way we get things done and it's how we meet and it's you know and so really HR should be thinking about what are the norms here right what are the things that are people like us in this company do things like this right so they kind of still still from Seth Godin it's you know how do we think about that and so that's a really good place for HR to be looking if if we're seeing that our company typically is pretty you know, pretty much doesn't like to disagree with each other, that we're pretty avoidant to have, you know, open and honest discussions, then that should be an area that HR ought to be thinking about all the time, right? Because that we're just going to end up in an echo chamber and we're going to have a lot of group thought and we're going to lose good people because they don't feel heard. Maybe we have a great organization, but we got a couple leaders that just show up and just throw up on everybody. And, and so we do okay until they show up and kind of ruin everything for us. Then maybe we need to work on that transition, right? There's always, I think there's these things that HR can be thinking about all the time. Um, and, 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 if, and if that's not enough, the, the world is always throwing things at HR. I mean, for God's sakes, 2020 has been an HR nightmare, right? I mean, the amount of the heavy lifting they have had to do this year, they all deserve a raise and an award, in my opinion. So um, but, you know, just thinking about how we can get better all the time is really that area where I think that that's where the, that's where HR can become, you know, not so worried about cost, but can be really a, help us grow and help us be better. So as, as a CEO and you run into one of those challenges that you mentioned within your organization, you know, your, the norms that you talked about, and you're trying to help them kind of work around or work through or whatever term you want to use with that challenge as the CEO, like how are you helping them to overcome that and, and turn that, as you said, this avoidance of difficult conversations, what are you doing? Are you just assuming they're going to do everything and then all of a sudden it's all going to be better? Or are you as a mm -hmm. CEO, how, how are you doing that in tandem with them? So we're very team-based, right? And so we have a lot of overlap on teams. We have a lot of people who lead teams that are not necessarily the most senior person. So I like to create systems that are already going to be healthy and will help me reinforce the things that are important to our organization on, on from day to day. It, it, and so I think having a rigid hierarchy sort of causes problems. Uh, we try to undo that as much as we possibly can. Um, the second thing is as the CEO, I have to live it. I have to be a good example. Um, so I'll give you an example. I mean, we, a few years back, we instituted a policy of if you're wired, you're fired. Meaning if you're going on vacation and you're on answering emails and you're showing up to web, you're, you're, you're going to be out of here. Like we, and we say that jokingly, but like we mean it. And so the first thing we did was institute that policy. We don't want people, you, when you're on vacation, I don't mean like one day or something. I mean, like you're taking a week or two weeks, you're going on family vacation. I want you to unplug. I want you to be totally not thinking about, about business and about your job and everything else. And so I had to do that, right? If I'm showing up, if I'm making it an exception, then I'm sending the message to everybody else that, I don't really value this. And this was something that we thought as a company it was really important because we saw burnout. We saw people getting, you know, overworking. And so we instituted that. No, I appreciate that so much. It's, it's interesting. You, you talked quite a bit there about systems, right? You, you developed the system and then you, you as a CEO provided that support to HR. So if all of a sudden they put the system in place and there goes Chris on vacation, but he's checking his email 15 times and mm -hmm. calling a bunch of people. And then when he gets back, complaining about how big his inbox is, then all of a sudden, like what's HR supposed to do? I think that's a challenge for a lot of human resource professionals of getting the support from their CEO or other leadership that the things that we say we're going to do, we're going to live by those. Right. And I think that's at times a unique conflict. And I, I don't know if, if you've seen that with clients of yours or in your experience, like the point that you do that, you're basically, you might as well not even have the HR team that you do because in essence, you're undermining their, 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 their opportunity to lead uh, in, in spite of you as, as, a, as an owner or CEO. Yeah. And I often really worry about people overworking. And I'm, I'm thinking about that because I want to retain my people. I want them to be their best. I also know that when they go on vacation and they don't think about work, they're actually going to come back fresher and be better. Like well, hey, Chris, I appreciate you being on the show. I'm going to get you out of here on this. This is my standard end of the 
uh, video series question and in the podcast is if you were able to describe someone doing HR like a boss, how would you describe it? Doing HR like a boss means you need to demand and ensure that you're at the table making strategic decisions inside the organization. You cannot be, we talked about the that sort of two types that I broke down. You can't be spending all your time in the tactical and in the, the generalist type stuff. You need to be, if you're going to act like a boss, you got to be there with whoever the other bosses are and, and delivering uh, solutions, delivering strategic thoughts and ideas uh, and, 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 and finding ways to say yes, right? So finding ways to say yes to the things and the ideas that are coming up and not be the, the no person or the, you know, uh, I guess the, the, the crusher of dreams, which sometimes HR can be, um, you know, how do we say yes? How do we find a way to get things done? So, yeah. That's good. No, I appreciate that. And I, I think it was really great how you started talking about transparency, the kind of that first pillar in, in your book um, that, that you talked about in culture. It's paramountly important to be able to do that and share as much as you can with your employees so there aren't surprises and they can contribute. And then you also talked about how HR can look at our norms and how, how we work within that and undoing, you use the term rigid hierarchies which I think are never good within an organization, especially uh, for us small businesses, those are definitely uh, not, not, not an ideal spot. And you also mentioned in your story about the systems and your support, and then eventually how, how do you help getting to a yes and supporting your HR function? So really appreciate you being on the show today. So thank you to everyone for checking out today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Please like, comment, subscribe, and share with a friend. And until next time, let's continue to aspire to do amazingly awesome HR.